Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Greg Thomas, and I am the president of the Wings Club Europe. It's a great pleasure for me to be back in Dublin, the founding city of the European chapter of the Wings Club. When we set up today's lunch, we inadvertently booked it on Ash Wednesday. Once we realized, we then we went into a debate about um, whether we should set the dress code as sackcloth and ashes. Then it moved on to just me wearing sackcloth and ashes. Uh, but finally, we settled on uh, compromising with serving you all fish today. So I hope you all enjoy the, the lunch. Um, the Wings Club is a venerable organization of aviation individuals that was founded in 1942. It is a club of tradition, and one of those traditions is introducing the head table. I would like to introduce to you today at the head table, and I would ask each uh, member when uh, introduced to stand up and be recognized, uh, Candice Kimmel, who is the president of Adams Unlimited. <laughs> Patrick Murphy, the former CEO of Ryanair. Robert Aronson, the former CEO of ACI, a former, and a former president of the Wings Club. John Slattery, the brains behind the Wings Club Europe chapter, and a, for, and a past president of the Wings Club in New York. Declan Power is the head of business development of Shannon Airport. David Barger, who is the immediate past president of the Wings Club and the president and CEO of JetBlue. And finally, let me introduce our guest speaker today, Tony Davis, who's the president and CEO of Tiger Airways. Entering the room late, <laughs> um, let me introduce to you Harris Herman, the general manager of the Wings Club in New York. Um, it's also a tradition of the club that uh, past presidents be recognized. We have three, three uh, past presidents sitting at the uh, head table. There is another past, past president in the room. Jim King was the previous president of the Wings Club Europe. Jim, could you stand up and be recognized? I'm here today courtesy of two low-cost airlines. I flew yesterday from Geneva to Barcelona with EasyJet. And then this morning I flew from Barcelona with Ryanair. It is fitting that we have as our speaker today the president and CEO of Tiger Airways, um, another rising star in the low-cost airline world, Tony Davis of, of the uh, Tiger Airways Group. Um, I will stop speaking now and uh, leave you to your fish but uh, Tony will speak uh, immediately after dessert. Thank you very much. Tony was the founding managing director of BMI Baby in 2002. Prior to that, he had senior positions at British Midland and Gulf Air. And prior to that, he learned everything he had to forget in his current career at British Airways. <laughs> Mr. Davis is an MBA from Lancaster University, a fellow of for, of the Society for the Encouragement of the Arts and a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome Tony Davis. Thank you very much and, and, and thank you ladies and gentlemen um, for taking time today to have lunch with Tiger Airways. Uh, it was a splendid lunch, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, I'd like to say that the food we serve on Tiger Airways is just as good as uh, the lunch you've just enjoyed. Um, I'd like to say that, um, but... Uh, we are a low-cost airline. Um, I think uh, when I first received this invitation to address the Wings Club, it was with a certain amount of uh, trepidation. Uh, I was lucky enough to be here a couple of years ago to see uh, Alan Joyce um, uh, address the club. And I must admit, my first thought was, um, they do know I'm not Irish. Um, I mean, it's, it's become 
modern folklore that uh, Messrs. O'Leary, Walsh, and Joyce have created that uh, any airline CEO with a predisposition to cost management um, must be Irish. Um, so I have to confess and say, well, actually, I, I was born in the East End of London, I'm sorry. I didn't quite qualify on that front. Um, but I can tell you that cost management growing up in the East End of London was pretty important as well. Um, so whilst I wasn't actually born in Ireland, Declan Ryan, who's one of the uh, founding investors in Tiger, um, does keep reminding me that uh, there must be a little bit of Irish blood in me somewhere, because I, I certainly do manage costs very effectively. Um, the other thing that was uh, being discussed over, over lunch was uh, several people asked me about the name of Tiger Airways, and it might be fun just to share with you the, the history of how Tiger got its name. Um, you can imagine that when, when four great investors like Singapore Airlines and Tomasic Holdings, uh, the, the Ryan family, um, and, and Indigo Partners, which is founded by uh, Bill Frankie, uh, the ex-chairman of uh, America West, when they were trying to come up with a name for this airline, um, it was not an easy thing to do. You have all these brains, these great airline uh, people, and they're trying to set up a new business in Asia and name this company, and no one could think of a name. And uh, Declan tells me the story that uh, it was a, a dinner, probably not unlike this, where all these senior executives were enjoying uh, a good meal, and they were trying to come up with a name for this airline, and they just couldn't do it. So the story goes that Jack Ryan, uh, Declan's son, actually came into the dinner and said to uh, Dr. Tony Ryan, you know, what, what's going on? You know, what's, the, what's all this uh, debate? You've been here hours, you know. If he, I think he was 10 or 12. And um, Dr. Ryan said, well, we're trying to name this airline. And Jack, as quick as a flash, said, why don't you call it Tiger? And all these airline executives looked at each other and said, you know what, an Asian airline, not a bad idea, Tiger, no? Why, Jack, do you think we should call it Tiger? And he said, well, it's easy. The Tiger economies are in Asia. Tiger beer is in Singapore. Uh, tiger balm, you know, all these tigers, it's a great name for an airline in Asia. And you know, they all looked at each other and thought, you know, maybe he's right. And Dr. Ryan, as quick as a flash, went to his wallet, got 20 euros out, gave it to Jack, and said, now I own the name. <laughs> so... So that's the history of how we got our name. Um, I'd like to say thank you to all the many organizations that are represented here today, um, which have made, helped make Tiger such a success. I think it's also a great testament to Ireland and to Dublin that so many of those uh, organizations have offices and headquarters here in Dublin. And certainly my diary has been very busy over the last couple of days being here in Dublin. So thank you for your support. Thank you for coming today. I think the other thing I would say is you heard, I've been in this business 25 years, so it's, I'm probably one of those individuals that does have kerosene flowing through his veins and given the price of oil right now I should probably start bottling it but you know see, Tiger Airways um, did start flying seven years ago it's been a very rapid seven years and what I'd like to do today is just spare a little bit of uh, time going through the history of Tiger and, and some of the things that we've learned along that journey. Uh, there's a very famous uh, curse um, that is reputed to have its history in, in ancient China and it's that you wish your enemies to live in interesting times. And I think it's fair to say that the sudden spike in, in crude oil prices has certainly created yet another interesting period for aviation. Um, it's also said that necessity is the mother of invention. So it's clear that we have, a, as an industry, to put some of the, uh, uh, put to, to rest rather, some of the long held structural issues that for far too long have imposed inefficiencies and unnecessary costs on aviation. Improvements in overall aviation infrastructure are now becoming urgent. I'm not just talking about runways or terminals, I'm talking about things like using modern technology to improve air traffic control procedures. We've got to let individual airplanes uh, control their own individual airspace rather than an archaic system of air corridors that look more like a 19th century rail network. We also need to get serious about the balance between environmental concerns and economic growth, especially in developing countries. We need to end the, uh, the, the punitive taxation that's designed to curb demand and incess, instead provide incentives for incessment, investment sorry, in modern aircraft and efficient high density operations. We need to move beyond aviation being a green villain and encourage serious investment in research and development for, for alternative fuel and power sources for aircraft. 
Certainly, if Airbus and Boeing are here, I'm in the market for airplanes powered by water. Um, it's, it's also clear that not all airlines will survive or, or prosper in these difficult times. But to paraphrase Mark Twain, reports that the increase in oil prices will cause the death of the low fare airline model have been greatly exaggerated. It's not correct that high oil prices have a greater impact on low fare airlines. Um, if anything, I believe the opposite is true. Low fare airlines generally have new fuel efficient aircraft and our business model is predicated on volume and continuous growth. Fuel makes up a higher percentage of our cost base mathematically but that's because all the other costs we manage absolutely to the bone. They're scrutinized and, and removed wherever it's possible. And hence, we're in a better position to manage our total costs than our peers in the legacy airlines. So as, as those legacy airlines seek to reduce capacity, retire older aircraft, reduce employee numbers, and withdraw from markets, they create new opportunities for low fare airlines like Tiger to grow and fill the gap. My own view is that the cost challenge will lead to further polarization of our industry, where successful airlines are either at the top end of the quality product, people like Singapore Airlines, who can justify a price premium uh, over their competitors, or airlines like Tiger that operate with the lowest costs in the world, and as a result can consistently offer lower fares than our competitors. It may not be the case of the survival for all, but it will be, certainly be the case of a survival of the fittest business model. The place not to be right now is the middle ground, which regrettably is where most of the world's airlines currently sit. They're neither fish nor fowl, low fare or superior quality. But the position for Tiger Airways is clear. We are a true low cost airline. We don't just say it, we really mean it. It is what we do and it is core to our business model. Saying you're a low fare airline is pretty easy. In fact, there are more than 50 airlines in Europe today that claim to be low fare airlines. Indeed, offering low fares is pretty easy too. Anyone can reduce their price. It's making money doing it that's the difficult bit. Now we're a publicly listed company, I can share with you a few facts about the financial performance of Tiger Airways. I think some of you might be surprised that prior to our listing, the paid up capital of Tiger Airways, uh, we have an airline in Singapore, we also have an airline in Australia, um, was just 24 million Sing dollars. That's about 14 million euros. Um, at the market listing, our capitalization was in excess of 750 million dollars. So 30 times return in six years. Uh, not, not bad going. More, moreover, our investment in Tiger Airways Australia was entirely funded by positive cash flow. And the paid up capital of that business today is still one Australian dollar. So to be clear, the overriding corporate objective for the company is sustainable profitability, even through difficult training conditions. In our last financial quarter, which ended back in December, we delivered a $30 million profit uh, before tax. That was an 18% margin, 18% in the airline business. Right? Um, so we're delivering very solid returns for our investors with still a relatively small fleet of just over 20 aircraft. I've often said that moving from the, the full, side, full, excuse me, full service side of the industry to the low fare uh, uh, airlines is a bit like a religious conversion. Suddenly you realize that for all those years we got the cost base wrong. You suddenly get a clear understanding that the multilateral industry frameworks of yesteryear, tariff coordination, IT integration between competitors, and complex distribution systems all place disproportionate cost burdens on airlines. Actually, these complicated and expensive travel procedures, interline agreements, standardization protocols, hub and spoke operations, benefit only a relatively small number of passengers. And that in reality, the vast majority of passengers make simple point-to-point -point journeys. The stark reality is that complex journeys usually just result in misconnections, lost bags, and lower profits. So we've come to understand that a bit like cinemas, don't make all their money from the admission ticket alone. They make it from soft drinks, they make it from hot dogs, popcorn. We in the airline business can do the same thing. We can make significant profits from selling things that we used to give away for free. And certainly, um, as an airline, we, we put a high priority on ancillary revenues. We're actually the ancillary revenue leader in Asia. Over 20% of our total revenues come from things that we used to give away for free. 
So the difference between success and failure, often, therefore, is often just a matter of discipline, of saying no to those tempting deviations to the pure model. It's a bit like being thrust into the candy store every day of the year. Yet for too many airlines, the temptation of higher yields, if you're only willing to spend, or do I mean invest, a bit more in your product, is too tempting. If they offer this or that, lounges, frequent flyer programs, bigger seats, more legroom, all of this will lead passengers to fall over themselves to pay higher fares. It's certainly not the proven experience of major retailers. The growth strategies of people like Sam Walton are based on a stack it high, sell it cheap philosophy, not on moving up markets or high, to achieve higher prices. So I even had my own personal anecdote to these temptations. Deck Ryan was actually sitting on my board and reminded me every day, cost is king. And that cost is really king for us because the lowest cost producer always wins. As Michael O'Leary said, people will crawl naked over broken glass to make a booking if the fares are low enough. Actually, he didn't say that. It was a bit ruder, but I thought as I'm being filmed and it might be shown in the States, I should tone it down a bit, but you get the gist. Over 96% of our bookings from uh, Asia are using the, the, uh, excuse me, the internet. That's not because internet access is so widespread in countries like the Philippines, Vietnam, and Thailand, but because we offer the lowest fares. And to get the lowest fares with Tiger Airways, you have to be using the internet. There are countless examples of full service carriers trying to adopt the low cost model. However, most of these have failed. From the outset, Singapore Airlines has been our largest shareholder, but more importantly, not a controlling shareholder. And it is the relationship with Singapore Airlines that is unusual. Unlike so many legacy airlines that have either invested or created low-fare airlines of their own, Singapore Airlines has treated us as a purely strategic investment, not a way of achieving, achieving a cheap method to expand their network or restructure their own cost base. We do not have seconded staff from Singapore Airlines and Tiger Airways. We don't receive rebated staff travel from them even. We don't co-chair, we don't participate in their frequent flyer program. Indeed, the reverse is true. We compete with them on several routes, and I wouldn't have it any other way. They know that whilst they operate one of the world's most successful and profitable premium service airlines, they know very little about how to run a low-cost airline like Tiger, which is where the experience of the management and the other investors like Ryan Asia came in. So when I joined Tiger in December 2004, we operated just three routes, all of them to Thailand. But the market opportunity in Asia is much greater than just services between Singapore and Thailand. The region boasts a population of more than three billion people. That's six times greater than the EU. And GDP and disposable income rates are growing much faster in Asia compared to the global averages. The geography of the Asia Pacific region lends itself to air travel. Vast expanses of water, thousands of islands coupled with poor international ground infrastructure make road or rail substitutability impossible. I don't know if any of you have ever thought about driving from Singapore to Ho Chi Minh City, but I wouldn't recommend it. It'd probably take you a week, a couple of sets of tires, and a flight with Tiger is only two hours. So on a personal level, when I was presented with the opportunity to start up a low-fare airline in the most populous region of the world, or, or carry on trying to compete as a UK operator against airlines like Ryanair, the, the choice was obvious and it didn't take me very long to move to Singapore. Singapore is Southeast Asia's premier aviation hub. The country has a well-deserved reputation of aviation and engineering excellence, and is a natural intersection between major international markets such as India, China, and Australia. So Stanford Raffles certainly worked that out a couple of centuries ago. Singapore is also the preeminent location in Southeast Asia for corporate headquarters. The infrastructure, corporate environment, uh, tax structures, quality of local employees, and its progressive immigration policies for expatriates all make Singapore an ideal location for a multinational country like, uh, company like Tiger Airways. And as an ex-board member of the Singapore Tourism Board, I'd be remiss if I didn't encourage you to all come and visit Singapore soon. It still amazes me that a city-state such as Singapore can attract more than 10 million visitors a year. Singapore has two world-class integrated resorts, um, it's actually a casino, but don't tell anyone. Um, and they also host uh, a night Formula One Grand Prix around the city circuit. So please come visit soon. What Tiger is doing is we're growing our business rapidly. 40% growth this summer in Singapore. 
But for an airline like Tiger, the lack of a domestic market in Singapore meant we always had to consider ourselves to be a pan-regional airline rather than a Singaporean airline. The great thing about low-cost airlines, though, is that this objective is achievable. Unlike our legacy cousins, local fare airlines can and do successfully cross national borders organically. Think Ryanair with bases across Europe rather than British Airways or Lufthansa. The regulatory challenges in Asia are, of course, greater than they are here in the single aviation market of the European Union. It does mean, as a group of airlines, that we still need to deal with the archaic ownership and control regulations that resulted from post-war Chicago Convention rules. These restrictions continue to limit the free flow of investment capital and are even more ironic given that whilst aviation is the very lifeblood of international trade, we continue to have some of the most prohibitive international investment restrictions of other, any industry in the world. There are, however, some countries that have taken a more liberal approach to aviation investment. Both Australia and New Zealand allow 100% foreign ownership of their respective domestic airlines. This enlightened approach to inward investment was one of the drivers towards the creation of Tiger Airways Australia last year. It does mean, however, that we are forced to hold and incur the expense of multiple air operator certificates. Two are already in operation, and we're in the process of developing two more AOCs with the establishment of Thai Tiger in Thailand and our partnership with Sea Air in the Philippines. So even though we're only seven years old, we now have a formal group structure in place with a holding companies in Singapore. We own two airlines in outright, and we have equity stakes now in two airlines going forward. And all of this is enabling us to grow our brand and our model on a pan-Asian basis. Tiger Airways now operates to all of, majors, uh, sorry, all of Asia's major growth markets, with services to India, where we have three cities to Greater China. We serve six destinations uh, sorry, uh, in Greater China. We also have destinations in Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, and so on. We also have the domestic airline in Australia. When we announced the uh, plans to set up our uh, domestic airline in Australia, we had a whole host of people telling us that there was no room for another airline. Commentators pointed out that uh, various startup airlines had come and gone. Um, they, they said this was proof that there was only room for two major national airlines in Australia. Industry analysts and commentators alike ignored the fact that there was an obvious lack of real competition in Australia. If you like, they failed to see an obvious gap in the market, a market segment in Australia that was crying out for our product and our low fares. It all felt very familiar to the types of comments that incumbent airlines and industry commentators made when Ryanair started operating in Europe. I've often reminded people that at the time I worked for the world's favourite airline based at Heathrow, and now today that title has been conquered by an Irish uh, low-cost airline. Our entire network of 37 destinations across two airlines is operated with a single fleet of just 25 Airbus A320 aircraft, offering considerable cost efficiencies and we have been committed to growing our fleet to almost 70 aircraft by 2015. Our aircraft have all been delivered from the factory brand new. There's not many airline CEOs that can say all their uh, aircraft have had just one careful owner. And Tiger Airways is also one of the few airlines uh, in the world to operate and maintain our aircraft to ETOP standards, allowing us direct routing across the Indian Ocean to both Australia and, Indi uh, and India. I've touched previously on our two recently announced partnerships, and I'll give you a bit more flavor about those now. First, we will be establishing a low-cost airline based in Bangkok through our partnership with Thai Airways called Thai Tiger. Uh, we see Thailand as a major opportunity to expand our business both domestically and internationally. Thai are equally pleased to have an effective vehicle to compete um, with other low-cost airlines in Thailand and abroad. We're also delighted that uh, Ryan, Asia, uh, Ryan Thai actually will uh, take an equity investment and will be rep represented on the Thai Tiger board by Declan Ryan. Our second partnership that's been recently announced is with Southeast Asian Airlines, or Sea Air, based out of the Philippines, where we'll take a 32% uh, equity interest. Sea Air was founded by Iran Dornier and is already part of Tiger's partner airline program, where flights are operated by Sea Air between their base in Clark in the Philippines and, and, and uh, using the, the aircraft provided by us and distribution provided through our website. The equity investment strengthens our presence in the Philippines and allows Sea Air to expand its operations both domestically and internationally. In fact, Sea Air will be launching daily flights between Clark and Hong Kong just next week. As always, the paperwork and regulatory approval of both these equity deals is extensive, but we should be finalized by the end of this year. 
So with four airlines competing for aircraft capacity going forward, Tiger Singapore, Tiger Australia, Thai Tiger, and our partnership with SEA, we couldn't be in a better position in terms of opportunities for growth. It's always better to, a better position to be in when opportunities for growth outweigh your supply of aircraft. So in conclusion, we remain bullish on the future for low-cost airlines like Tiger Airways. We are located in the most dynamic growth market in the world and operate with one of the lowest costs of any airline globally, a cost base that will further reduce as we take delivery of more aircraft and as we enter more cost-effective markets. We believe, therefore, that we have both the business model and the corporate structure to continue to grow our business successfully and profitably on a pan-Asian basis. So in closing, I'd just like to thank the Aviation Club for organising the event today. Thank you for attending and uh, happy to take any questions you might have. It's a tradition uh, as a thank you from the club to give a small gift to the speaker. Traditionally, this has been a historic um, photograph of the uh, speaker's airline. So we went deep, deep, deep into the history of Tiger Airways <laughs> all of seven years ago. And... Um, we found a photograph of their very, very first aircraft um, leaving Toulouse in Europe, so even before it entered service. Um, please accept this with our thanks for, for giving us a great speech today, Tony. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh,